fortunate to have Dr. Terry Greiling as our first presenter. Dr. Greiling is an assistant professor of dermatology and an associate program director of research in dermatology at the Oregon Health and Sciences University School of Medicine in Portland, Oregon. Dr. Greiling has a special interest in autoimmunity, including lupus and scleroderma. After her dermatology residency at Yale, she went on to complete a postdoctoral research fellowship studying how the microbiome affects individuals with autoimmune diseases, particularly lupus. She also provides dermatologic care at the Center for Health and Healing and at the Center for Women's Health at OHSU. For the first part of her presentation today, Dr. Growling will be discussing the role the microbiome plays in lupus. Now, we welcome Dr. Greiling. Well, thank you so much for the invitation to speak today on one of my favorite topics, which is lupus, skin, and the microbiome. So I'll start with my disclosure slide. I don't have any conflicts of interest related to lupus or the microbiome, but I do have some research funding pharmaceutical companies to study rare skin diseases. So today I'm going to talk about microbiome and lupus, and then go into what lupus means to a dermatologist and different subtypes of that, and then how to protect skin with lupus. And just a few words about me. So I am a medical doctor and a scientist. I wear both hats and this talk will be um, about both of those things. I'm at Oregon Health and Science University and I take care of patients uh, in multiple locations there, including a shared rheumatology, dermatology clinic. And since I wear many hats, of course, I'm also a mother and uh, a daughter and a wife and a friend. And so uh, lots of things uh, to work with. Um, so going into lupus and the microbiome, the first question starting with, well, what is lupus and what in the immune system goes awry in lupus? And it's a difficult question to answer. It's always a very complicated diagram when you try to map it. And I think that's because the answer is really everything. So it starts with a mix of genetic changes and environmental factors. And together, those lead to altered cell death and then really immune activation so that patients' immune systems make antibodies and T cells, plasma cytoid dendritic cells, all these cells that come together and create the inflammatory response that causes the cell damage in lupus. And so I think the traditional view of thinking about why lupus occurs is that the immune system is making a mistake and getting overactivated and attacking people's bodies. And I want to turn that paradigm a little bit and think about the role the microbiome plays in that and that some of these immune systems, immune responses may not be an error, uh, that people's bodies with lupus may actually be reacting to certain microbes uh, that are part of the microbiome that's creating some of this immune activation. And so that's what I want to tell you about today. So launching into then, well, what is the microbiome? So that term is used to describe all of the creatures, all of the microbes that live on and in us. So that includes bacteria, fungus, viruses, other single-celled organisms, and they live on every body site. So they cover every square inch of our skin. They live in our whole digestive tract from the mouth to the stomach to the intestines. They live in the lungs. They live in the bladder, urethra, and the vagina, every site where our body interacts with the outside world. And so, of course, the question is, well, what are they doing there? Now, there are different types of relationships that we have with our microbiome. Traditionally, we thought about microbes as infections, as pathogens that come in, uh, attack our bodies, and then our immune system attacks back to get rid of them and clear the infection. But the idea of the microbiome is that we have all these what are called commensal species that live on us all the time and are not hurting us. Um, and so uh, a commensal relationship is one that the microbes may be taking nutrients or living off of us and they're neutral to us. And even many of them are what we call mutualists, that they provide useful things to us. They synthesize essential vitamins. They help us digest our food. Now, another concept that's um, becoming more popular lately is the idea of a pathobiont. And that is a microbe that in some people, in some situations, is completely harmless, but in other situations can overgrow and help lead to disease. 
and I compare it to an invasive species. So if we think of our, our bodies as similar to the Earth's global ecosystem, that um, you think of something like, uh, I was thinking of an example of the brown marmorated stink bug, which is a native to China and Japan, but has now come to the US and is eating our fruit crops and coming into people's homes and has become an invasive species. So you can think of a pathobiont microbe in the body like that. Now, as I said, these, these microbes are everywhere. There's about equal numbers of bacteria and human cells in one person. And that leads to the question, you know, we hear a lot about the microbiome in the last number of years, and why is this topic so popular right now? And the answer to that is really technology, that whereas we didn't used to have the technology to understand what what microbes are there, now we do. So the old way of studying microbes is you have to use a petri dish and grow every individual bacteria. And each, each bug has its own mix of nutrients that it likes and different gases that it wants to breathe. And that is impossible. We, there are so many species that we, we just can't grow. And so now we use genetic sequencing and that's really why uh, the advent of the microbiome study has become popular. We can take a swab of some site that's colonized by microbes and and extract the DNA and run that through a high throughput genetic sequencer and from that get back a list of genetic sequences and map those back to the bacteria or viruses or fungi that are there. And so that's now gotten easy and relatively cheap to do and has allowed us to really understand what's there and then now start to take that next step of well what are they doing. Now, the type of bacteria and other microbes that live in each location on the body really depends on that location. So if you think about it, again, as a global ecosystem, the space between the toes may be like a tropical beach environment, and inside of the stomach uh, is more like a, a boiling uh, volcanic uh, lake. And so that location is, is very specific down to you know, tiny little changes, for example, where you are in the skin. So this diagram is showing uh, where they took a couple of volunteers and they mapped 400 sites on the skin on the outside of the body. Every square inch, they took a different swab. And this is just showing three representative bacteria. So the first one is staph. And you can see the, the red color means there was a lot of staph there and the blue means there was just a little bit. And if it's dark, there was nothing. And so if you look at the bottom of the feet, you see lots of red dots lighting up, but as you move up the ankle, that kind of fades away. And the same with the middle column is Propionobacterium, which is um, uh, acne is one, uh, the bacteria that causes acne is one species of that. And so you see it lighting up in the cheek and the temple and the forehead, and then not as much you know, on the arms and legs and hands and feet. And so our relationship with these bacteria starts at birth and goes on for your whole life. And you need this relationship with your microbiome. It actually helps train your immune system on how to function. Once the baby is in the womb, it's a sterile environment, but the second the baby emerges, so whether that be through the birth canal and the skin is colonized with all the microbes that are part of the birth canal, or by C-section, the baby is colonized with just sort of what's floating in the air of the room on the skin. And so that's a difference at birth. And that normalizes already by two weeks of age, but there are many who believe that that early window of what we call dysbiosis, so having an abnormal balance of microbes, then can affect your response to health and disease throughout your life. Then, of course, babies start to eat and their digestive tract is colonized by microbes from breast milk or from formula. And then the diet and the foods we eat that for the rest of our life goes on to influence what types of microbes are there in our digestive tract. And everything else we do from exercise affects our microbiome. Um, disease states definitely alter that balance. Aging, hormones, drugs that we take, medications, where we live in the world, all of these things affect our microbiome throughout life. And just to go back to the idea of medications that affect our microbiome, this is a, a figure from one of my favorite papers that came out in the journal Nature two years ago. And they did this great experiment where they took 40 common bacteria that live in the gut, and they basically fed those bacteria all the 1,200 different medications that are available in this country and saw you know, how does it alter um, these these bacteria. And they saw that there were 200 medications that were not antibiotics, but actually killed at 
least one of those gut bacterial species. And so examples of this uh, include things that are commonly used to treat patients in lupus. So methotrexate, azathioprine, proton pump inhibitors, which block heartburn, calcium channel blockers, which treat high blood pressure, um, treatments for diabetes. There are a lot of things on this list. But it's also important to know that that's not always necessarily a bad thing. So um, it could even be the way that they alter the microbiome is part of the reason why the medication works. And so one recent example of that was a study looking at statins, which are a type of medication for high cholesterol. And they saw that people who take statins have a, a rebalancing of their gut microbiome, which appears to lead to the decrease in total body inflammation um, and actually benefit of the body of taking that medication. So on this theme of we influence our bacteria and they influence us. So this diagram, what it's trying to show is a cross section through the intestine. And you see um, some different bacteria that are living in there, the green, red, and yellow microbes. And there's some little um, green hexagons too. And that's supposed to be a food basically that's not digested yet. So a starch in your intestine. And then the purple structure is the, the blood vessels that drain the, the intestine. So it's the portal vein. So as you digest all your food, it ends up into the blood and then it goes straight to the liver. And then the liver gets to try to take out all the toxins and things that shouldn't be in your body. And then the li liver feeds the rest of your body all of those nutrients. And so some examples of how the bacteria are affecting this is the bacteria then help us digest food. So when, when food gets to the large intestine that hasn't been digested, some of the bacteria are able to help digest that for us. And so you see examples of then those nutrients getting into your system that are aided by bacteria bacterial digestion. And then bacteria release other byproducts. So they eat our food and then they release their own with our waste products from bacteria, but maybe something like essential vitamins for us as they digest nutrients. So those may be good things or they may be bad things. So there's also evidence that bacteria release uh, harmful free fatty acids. And so that's another thing in, in patients with lupus, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, as we get better at, at helping patients with lupus survive, um, they then, uh, mortality is mainly from heart disease. And so um, there is evidence to show that the free fatty acids uh, are higher in the bloodstream of people with lupus. And that contributes to heart disease. And a lot of those can come from certain bacteria in the gut. And then another way bacteria can directly influence us, again, coming from the gut, is the idea of translocation, that there are certain situations in which the bacteria can actually escape directly through the wall of the intestine into the bloodstream of this circulation and end up in the liver. And it's not the same as a traditional infection as we would think about it, because if you if you go to the hospital with a, with a total body infection, you might take a blood sample and look for bacteria to grow in it, but this is blood that's only circulating from the intestines to the liver. So it's not something we can detect. But what I'm about to tell you about is this idea that um, that this may be happening to us all the time, but may be um, harmful in lupus. And so it's a big, again, a big shift to think about lupus as an infectious disease. And I'm not saying it's entirely an infection, but there are certain bacteria that may help activate the immune system in lupus. And so this is an example of work that was done from this group that I worked with when I was at Yale. And it's translocation of a bacteria called Enterococcus gallinarum. And the study started from this observation by Dr. Manfredo Vieira that we had some mice that have a genetic change and these light mice develop lupus. So they develop antibodies that attack their tissue. They get kidney disease that looks like lupus nephritis and eventually they develop antiphospholipid syndrome, which is something that people with lupus, um, some people have that where they develop blood clots that are very dangerous. And so these mice, when we gave them antibiotics to get rid of a lot of their gut bacteria, they survived. Um, and it was a dramatic change that normally by, in this graph is showing at 30 weeks of age, about 80% of the mice have already passed away. When you give them antibiotics, 80% are still alive. And so we asked, well, you know, what is it? What, what bacteria is driving this um, change? And so we found in these mice, they had a leaky gut. So their, their intestinal walls sort of allowed things to pass through more easily. And this allowed the Enterococcus gallinarum bacteria specifically was able to get through, escape into the liver and 
and spleen, and there it was able to activate a lot of these immune responses that we see in lupus and create the autoantibodies and, and create the inflammation. And furthermore, what's really promising, again, this hasn't this part hasn't been done in humans, but the mice were given a vaccine against this bacteria, and that actually protected them equally as well as giving them antibiotics. And so the evidence in people, you know, of course, these are not studies that you can easily do um, with human patients, but we were able to obtain some liver biopsy tissue from lupus patients who are going undergoing liver biopsies for another reason, and we're actually able to see this bacteria was present. We got we had three samples from lupus patients, but that was present in all three patients. So you know more to come. This is sort of recent uh, experimental evidence, but that that this could be one of the bacteria that is activating the immune system in lupus. So this next example is sort of a similar idea um, of translocation of bacteria that shouldn't otherwise be there. And so, you know, with the success in, in the first uh, group of mice, so we looked at another type of, of mice that develop lupus, and again, saw escape of a certain bacteria into the liver and spleen, but this time it was a different bacteria. It was one called Lactobacillus reuteri. And similarly, if we colonized the mouse guts with more Lactobacillus reuteri, they got sicker, but there was a way to fix it. Dr. Zagara Ruiz, who led this project, was really excited about the idea of how can we change the diet? How can we fix this with food? And so he fed the mice a special diet that was high in, a, in what's called resistant starch. So it's a type of starch that you find in oats, in raw potatoes, and actually cooled potatoes. So if you think about if you make Thanksgiving dinner and you have a big pot of mashed potatoes and you put them in the fridge and they form that kind of gelatinous congealed mass, that's the starch that you're looking for. It's also in uh, green bananas and, and certain legumes. And so it's a very, it was previously, uh, other studies have shown that's a really healthy type of starch that promotes certain and gut bacteria. And so he was able to show that if we give the mice this starch, they actually also had fewer lupus symptoms and got better. And so what he was able to show is that that type of starch helped certain good bacteria that are called Clostridialis and inhibited the growth of this Lactobacillus reuteri. Now, human studies have not been done with these different bacteria, but you, uh, so Lactobacillus reuteri specifically is a type of probiotic that you can buy at any health food store. And this was the one that was seemed to be promoting making lupus worse in these mice. And so I'll say more about pro probiotics later, but it makes me nervous that a lot of these probiotics just haven't been tested in people with different um, with autoimmunity. Okay, so changing uh, tax to uh, some different examples of, of where the microbiome and lupus um, interacts. So this one I'll, I'll call a case of mistaken identity, and the idea is that. When you mount an immune response toward a bacteria, you start making antibodies against that bacteria. But there are certain proteins, certain components of bacteria that are so important to function that we have, the, we share the same proteins with bacteria. So potentially, if you mount an immune response against this one part of the bacteria that you share with it, then those antibodies could turn around and attack us as well. And so this idea is called cross-reactivity. And we do have examples in in health and disease of this happening. So actually rheumatic fever is exactly that. So in rheumatic fever, you get a strep infection, you make antibodies against the strep bacteria, and then those antibodies cross-react with your heart, and that's what creates rheumatic fever. There's another example called Guillain-Barre syndrome that the similar things happen. Now those examples that we know of are where you get an infection, your body clears the infection, and then you get this short-lived autoimmune syndrome that then also goes away with some time. But what about the microbiome? These are commensals that stay with us for our whole life. So if one of those was driving a cross-reactive immune response, and we always have it, maybe that's what could be driving the chronic autoimmunity that we see in diseases like lupus. And so work that I did uh, is proposing that, that Rho60 is one such protein that we have and certain bacteria share and could be driving this response. About 50 or 60% of people with lupus have antibodies against this Rho protein. And we know it's, a, it's really important in lupus. Actually, you can find antibodies even five years before people have symptoms of their lupus. It can be an indication that it's coming and it sets off this inflammatory cascade. And so there are, I was able to find about 25 different bacteria um, that are part of our own microbiome that make this same Rho protein and that it's very similar to our own human protein. And so then experimentally, we were able to take antibodies and 
and T cells from patients with lupus and show that it really couldn't tell the difference between the bacterial protein and the human protein. And so all of that work really supports the idea um, that a healthy immune attack on bacteria can lead to these autoimmune responses in genetically susceptible people. And so I always think of it about it as a skin because some of these bacteria are actually skin bacteria. And so this image on the slide is of a patient with what's called subacute cutaneous lupus. And they get this very characteristic rash on the chest and back. And it's in this V-shaped distribution in those locations every time. And these patients have a lot of sun sensitivity. And so the reason that it's on the chest and back is always blamed on sun. But if you look at this image, I, I don't think this man was wearing a backless V-neck t-shirt and went into the sun. And that's exactly why the rash showed up there. And so this location of the rash is actually the same location of where you have these very oil rich follicles on your chest and back where one of the bacteria that makes Roe lives. And so I really think that that bacteria on our skin could be driving the immune response that creates the rash. And there's some other examples of this cross-reactive response that have come out recently. So patients with lupus nephritis, kidney disease, had a bacteria called Ruminococcus nevus in their stool and seemed to make antibodies against it that correlated with activity of their lupus nephritis and what's called double-stranded DNA antibodies that, that really is important in that disease. And there's another example, lupus patients who get antiphospholipid syndrome, again, this blood clotting disease, have antibodies to something called beta to glycoprotein 1 protein. And there's another bacteria called Roseburia intestinalis that has a little piece of it that looks very similar to the human beta 2 glycoprotein 1 and that the antibodies can cross react between those two different things and can drive that disease. And so again, coming back to the skin, which is, which is my main interest, is I think it's just such a fundamental question in dermatology in general that you know different diseases have these very characteristic rashes and they always show up in one location. So for example, eczema loves to show up in the little creases of the elbow and everyone asks, well, why there? And so it really, this could be true in so many different diseases where it's the, it's the balance of bacteria that are creating the inflammation that drives the disease um, that could be interacting with the immune system to create this. Okay, well, a question that I commonly get is, well, what can I do? You know, do I need to be taking probiotics? How can I uh, promote the health of my microbiome? And so the definition of a probiotic is a live microbe that confers a health benefit on the host when administered in adequate amounts. But then these are supplements. And so based on the laws in our country, supplements have to be tested for safety, but they don't have to prove that they work. They just have to prove that they don't kill you. And so there are only a few strains of bacteria and I have them all listed here. These are all of the different bacterial species that can be used in a probiotic because they've shown to be safe. So there's two main problems with that. And so the first one is that out of the thousands of bacteria that influence health and disease, these are pretty minor players. And so so taking any one of these probably isn't going to make that much difference in your overall health. And then number two, that safety hasn't really been established in people with autoimmunity. You know, what that does in the long term. Sure, you take the, this probiotic and you don't immediately die from an infection, but could it be promoting the wrong balance of your microbiome? And that just has not been studied at all. And so from, from the evidence in mice that if we feed them more that probiotic that their lupus gets worse. I kind of really don't prom um, recommend any probiotics in, in patients with, with specific diseases that hasn't been tested. So we don't know yet on how to manipulate the microbiome to really promote health and disease, but I think there's a lot of promise for this for the future. And so can we continue to establish what certain foods can promote the healthy microbes to outcompete the bad ones that we don't want? We're hopeful that microbiome transplants will be good. So fecal microbiome transplants are, are currently used in the hospital for people with uh, something called C. difficile, a type of bacterial infection. And actually this, the first study just came came out recently of using fecal transplants for people with Crohn's disease and inflammatory bowel disease and really showed some great benefit in that situation. And maybe we'll be able to do skin microbiome transplants as well uh, to help the cutaneous manifestations. Maybe we'll be able to develop targeted antibiotics if there's just a single bacteria you want to get rid of but not sort of get the rest of your microbiome out of balance. Um, hopefully that's another option for the future. As the one study showed, maybe we'll be able to find a vaccine to target certain 
certain bacteria uh, and delete them from your system. And maybe even the hope of phage therapy. So a phage is a virus that actually infects bacteria. And so we could make all the bad bacteria sick and, and get them out of our system. I have a lot of hope that, that this will be safer ways to treat lupus and other autoimmune diseases in the future. Um, and with that, I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Greiling. That was very informative. Now we have members from our lupus community who have some questions for you. Dr. Greiling, how can I tell when medications are affecting good bacteria? That's a great question. Um, we don't really know is the true answer. Um, how we're, Scientists are just starting to tease apart how um, different medications affect bacteria in different ways. But I think it is important to remember that uh, when a medication affects your bacteria, sometimes it's affecting the good bacteria and sometimes it's actually affecting the bad bacteria and that may be why it's working. Dr. Greeling, how does prednisone affect the microbiome? We know that prednisone affects the microbiome in multiple ways, and actually uh, the reverse is true too, that the microbiome affects prednisone. Um, so an, another really interesting scientific study came out in the past year that um, gut bacteria digest prednisone uh, the same way they do a lot of different medications. And so that the different balance of, of bacteria in your intestines may uh, dramatically affects the amount of prednisone that you actually absorb and can change the levels, and that's why people People respond to medications differently because they're it's digested by the bacteria. Uh, another example actually is on the skin, not in lupus, but we know that people with eczema um, and use prednisone or use topical corticosteroids to, which is similar to prednisone, to treat their eczema. When they use it on their skin and decrease the inflammation, that actually promotes the restoration of the normal, healthy microbiome. Um, so prednisone is useful in that way. Dr. Greiling, are there any specific probiotics that you would recommend? I'm afraid of probiotics, honestly, um, just from some of the work that's emerged. Um, I think it's better to feed our microbiome in a good way, so really using the foods you eat to help promote uh, the healthy bacteria that in turn will feed you. Um, so eating lots of fresh fruits and vegetables, all the things we know are important, um, are, are more important than one particular probiotic, in, in, especially in lupus that hasn't been proven yet. Thanks everyone for your great questions, and a big thanks to you, Dr. Greiling, from all of us at Kaleidoscope Fighting Lupus. We appreciate you spending time with us today and for sharing your knowledge and expertise with our community.